Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Hi, it's Roxanne Durhaj. I'm a mental health and wellness specialist and a corporate leadership executive coach. My new book, Return on Relationships, launching on June 10th, 2023, introduces the concept of return on relationships, a new metric for business growth. Grab a copy. Let me walk you through how to be a better leader and provide you with exclusive tools to guide you in building your authentic leadership legacy. You can find Link in the show notes to pre-order your copy today. Hope you enjoy. Hi, everyone. It's Roxanne Durhaj. Welcome again to Authentic Living with Roxanne. Today, I have a, I would say, a very good friend, Michael Kerr. Uh, As you see, he's saying hello to anybody that can see the video. And uh, Michael and I are both uh, members of the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers, where he's a Hall of Famer, which is a big, big deal. He's been doing uh, this speaking for quite a while, and he travels internationally speaking about culture um, and productivity in the workplace. Michael, thanks so much for coming on today. Well, thank you for having me, Roxanne. It's an honor to be here. It's, it's so fun to be here. And, and do you remember the last time we had a lot of fun? We did. When, where were we? Where, where were we? Do you, do you, where were we, Roxanne? We were in beautiful Ireland. In yes, Belfast, absolutely. We had so Belfast, much fun. We had so much fun. We laughed a lot. We we learned a lot. We talked a lot. And, uh, you know, I know this is the space that uh, uh, Michael pro- provided many elements where we were giggling um, and <laughs> learning at the same time in, in, in uh, Dublin. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what Michael talks about. And I think Michael naturally is very, very funny. Um, something that I have to work on when I, I know I speak to others. Uh, so Michael, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of what got you speaking? Like, you know, I know you speak all over the world. What got you in, involved or wanting to, to go out and speak about culture? Yeah, thank you, Roxanne. And by the way, I think you're very funny. Sometimes you don't <laughs> I, maybe realize you're being funny, but I think you're very funny. Is it because I have five foot nothing? Is that That's, why I'm No, funny? no, no. It's because you're adorable and you're just, you're just <laughs> Thank naturally you. That's funny. That's very just, nice. Just being you. <laughs> uh, so I, I got into speaking because I worked in a, what can only be described as a soul-sucking, fun-sucking workplace. You have to be very careful when you say fun-sucking fast, I've learned over the years. <laughs> yes, if you don't enunciate properly, yes. you know, you could get in trouble. Yeah, so I, I worked in this really soul-sucking, dysfunctional workplace culture. It was killing me. And I was a manager in this organization, but the culture was just abysmal. And despite my best efforts to influence the culture, to change it, to maintain my natural sense of humor in the face of all that, I knew I had to do something else with my life or it would kill me. And because I did a lot of speaking and training in that position, I knew that that was something I wanted to do. And because of the experience I went through, I decided to make that my life mission, to talk about how work shouldn't be sucking the life out of you, just the opposite. Work should be energizing us, that work is so important Mm -hmm. to our lives. It affects our marriages and family lives and our physical and mental health and our identity and our personal growth. It affects where you live. It's just a wee bit of a time sucker. So work goes far beyond than just collecting a paycheck in terms of its impact. And I wanna talk about how we owe it to our employees, we owe it to our customers, we owe it to the family members of our employees, we owe it to our souls to create as rocking, inspiring, and yes, as fun workplace culture as possible because this sucker matters a lot. So, you know, I talk a lot about um, being authentic. Right. And, you know, I think that naturally as human beings, we try to be as real as we can be. But sometimes in workplaces, sometimes people, I would say, sometimes have personas. You have to be, if you're the boss, you have to be the serious sure. guy. If, you sure. know, if, if you're the leading the team, you have to make sure everybody, you know, respects you. And there generally isn't 
I would think about myself when I worked in corporate um, that people literally didn't have a lot of fun or they didn't demonstrate that capacity to be light. And, um, you know, and I often thought, well, if people can giggle and laugh a little bit, it, it made so much more sense. But oftentimes it was like people felt they couldn't be themselves. What made you want to start to talk a little bit more about um, humor in the workplace? I talked a lot about humor in the workplace, and that kind of became my focus when I talked about great cultures for a couple of reasons. First of all, I was always known for my sense of humor. Uh, as a manager in any job I was in, I think I brought a lot of fun and positive energy and humor to the workplace. But I was also frustrated in those situations where I saw people not being their authentic selves, where they, as you said, Roxanne, put on these, these masks, right, and talk mm -hmm. in this weird way that they don't sound like when you're at the bar with them after work. Uh, and, yep. and these these fake sort of personas that everyone wears. And, and, and even feeling that pressure mm -hmm. to not be yourself, I found incredibly challenging and frustrating. So I wanted to talk about humor because it's, I think, a great gateway to talk about so many other workplace issues. We know that it's a powerful driver of workplace culture success for so many reasons. It also reflects workplace culture success. So it really was an evolution then. You started to talk about corporate culture and what would enable people to be more productive and present, I would say. And then all, and then because you're funny, like you said, bring that with you, that started to be implemented into your work as you did your, your keynotes and, and trainings. Is that what happened? Yeah, uh, well, actually, it was the opposite of that. I started speaking specifically, exclusively about humor in the workplace. Okay, and okay. the importance of having fun. But then it ended up evolving to talk about workplace culture because I started realizing that, well, this this is a lot deeper than just having fun at work. Yes, that's important. Mm -hmm. But as much as humor can drive a better workplace culture, it also reflects a better workplace culture, a healthier, more positive uh, workplace culture where, where there are positive relationships and there's trust and respect and all those good things we should be doing in any workplace. When you work in a workplace like that, it becomes that much easier to be more authentic, to be more real, to bring your natural sense of humor along for the ride. So when I started looking at it that way, I realized it's, it's just as important to talk about the things that organizations need to do to rock it with their workplace culture so that humor becomes the natural byproduct. So let's talk about some different sectors. We talk about manufacturing. We talk about hospitality. Um, you know, we could talk about banking. And some of these sectors don't have, they're not, don't have much of a sense of humor, right? And right. people are going to listen to this and go, oh yeah, Mr. Kerr, how, how am I going to go to the line and talk about being humorous? And that's going to make me feel better, Right. So what would you say to someone saying that? Look, you know what? My sector or my industry doesn't afford that. Like for a CEO listening that's saying, well, that's that's a good point. That might be nice, but it doesn't work with my my sector. What would you how would you reach out to someone? Like that? It's a great question. And in fact, I just wrote a long blog on that very topic on my website about mm -hmm. how do you add humor into a more traditional conservative organization or culture or industry where people perceive oh you know we can't have fun we're different than everyone else right yeah, but yeah. I get it you know a lot of people they're not you're not working in an amusement park mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes it can feel like it's more challenging but I have examples all over the world from every industry where people add humor it doesn't matter what you do for a living and a lot of that is just I think it's assumptions and it's perception that well we can't have any fun and really what I'm talking about ultimately is having greater success. So mm -hmm. if you wanna have greater success, then this is one of the tools, it's not the only one, but it's one of the tools that can help you achieve greater success. So I think a starting point is to, to really look at the benefits of this and sell the benefits of it. Don't talk about, hey, we have to make work more fun because some people might have a adverse reaction to that. But if you start talking about, hey, we need to do some things to reduce our employee turnover rate and absenteeism rate and employee presenteeism rate. And we need to manage our stress and 
be more resilient and build a more resilient workplace culture and be more innovative and creative and communicate more effectively and work better as teams and build stronger relationships. All those positive benefits that we know a little bit of humor and fun and play can help us achieve. So focus on the end results and know that there is a mountain of research that shows that humor helps with all of those goals. So if you wanna provide more remarkable customer service that is memorable and you want to build a thriving positive workplace culture then I think you have to realize that this is no joke and it's not about taking our work lightly it's, of course it's not about taking our customers lightly it's about taking ourselves lightly in order to take our work in fact more seriously and be even more professional in fact one of the things I say Roxanne that I think we can all relate to is when people take them, it's, it's about taking ourselves lightly, right? When people take themselves seriously, especially those senior managers, those CEOs and top leaders, the reality becomes no one takes you seriously anymore because you're taking yourself so darn seriously. <laughs> so it's about learning to laugh at the things you have no control over and mm -hmm. laughing at ourselves more in order to build connections, build trust in the workplace, build stronger relationships, to be more approachable. So I would say that that plays into vulnerability, right? Because if I can laugh at myself, then people go, well, you know, he or she's vulnerable. They, they, they see their flaws. And I mean, obviously we're all flawed as human beings, but as a, as a leader, I think, um, you know, you make some faux pas or you say something stupid or you do something stupid and you, and you make fun about that, then people feel you're more relatable. And if I, you're more relatable, they're going to go, oh my God, Michael Kurz just like me versus if you're stiff, stiff upper lip, you know, there's limbs falling around, you know, so much going on around you where you're not able to just step back. Then that, that lack of ability to feel like it's just like me, yeah. I think that gap kind of widens, but if oh, you're kind of able totally, to totally giggle about it, you're like, oh, right? she's humanizes. silly or he's silly. Yeah. 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 Totally humanizes humanizes us when when leaders are the first to do something goofy at a team building event to poke fun at themselves to admit their 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 bloopers then it totally mm -hmm. humanizes them and and there's this relationship between humor and trust that we know from research as well right that people who share a positive healthy sense of humor tend to be trusted more and i think that ties in as well to authenticity the reason that relationship right, exists right is because when you laugh at yourself, when you bring your sense of humor along for the ride, you come across as more real. Those personas you talked about earlier, those masks that we wear, mm -hmm. they fall to the wayside and you're just this, this lovable, approachable human being that we can all relate to because you're not taking things so darn seriously. And I think it would collapse silos as well, right? If you, I think organization, when I think of, well, when I worked in corporate, um, the leaders that had more that sense of um, being available, like if it's through humor or just vulnerability, those those seem to be the business units that we worked better with versus the ones that were, you know, so stoic or, you know, insular, the ones that were kind of, you know, the leaders that were more available and silly, it, those are the ones that it seemed to be easier to work, kind of collide in and out with those business units versus the ones that said, we're accounting, that's all we do. We don't do anything else. Um, and you know, I know myself as an account executive, I found it more difficult dealing with those individuals. Um, you know, I'm not a numbers person. I will never be a numbers person. I'm not microscopic. So oftentimes I'd be laughing at myself, right? right. Because I'm thinking, oh no, I just missed that you know, 2.5 CPI on this half a million dollar account. Oh, geez. And they're not thinking it's funny. They're thinking this is going to cost a lot of money. And they're not catching so funny, the Roxanne. Not so funny. <laughs> exactly. But um, so you talked a little bit. I'm just thinking the average senior person that's here, when I think of corporate culture and change, that takes a lot. So let's say you're a senior leader and you're listening to this, and there's been a lot of issues in your environment. What are some of the things that they should start thinking? They might say, oh, this would be nice to implement. But we've had a lot of things not go so well. If I'm think, starting to think of an overall corporate strategy about changing my culture and having people lighten up, what are some of the things that I should be thinking about? As a, as a senior leader. And, yeah, and that's and, had some stuff happen that has maybe not been so nice. 
Sure. And, and back to your earlier point, Roxanne, too, right? It's not rocket science, right? We want to work with people who have a good sense of humor. They're more likable. So as a senior leader, this is really important. So I think it starts with self-awareness mm -hmm. and it, it starts by just reflecting on your own attitude, how you're coming across. Are you not just approachable, but I like to use the language over approachable because we know just from nature of your position, just from nature of the power that you hold with your job title, you can be scary to a lot of your employees. And if you wanna create that psychological psychological safety in your workplace where employees can come to you with challenging questions and their concerns and their great ideas that you may be missing out on, you have to be uber over approachable. So being aware of just bringing a certain lightness and levity to how you interact with your employees, how you connect with them, being present, taking the time to connect with them is so important. And again, circling back to that idea of just laughing at yourself more, it is absolutely so, so important. So just being overly approachable with your sense of humor is, it may sound very simplistic, but it really is a key to so, so much. And that means you've got to as you said earlier, you've got to be a little vulnerable sometimes mm -hmm, to be mm -hmm. able to laugh at yourself. It's not always going to work. Uh, but the more you do that, the more you're going to create that, that tone, that lightness. And so then I would suggest that people look for those, those touch points that are so critical in an organizational culture to start to change the, the culture, to change the, the feeling of, of, of the workplace, like meetings. Meetings are incredibly important as a touch point in my books. Meetings help reflect or should reflect the culture that you want. And they also help create or foster that the culture you want. So if you want a fun, creative, innovative, positive, humane workplace culture, then boy, you better make sure your meetings are fun and innovative and humane and positive and all that good stuff. So making sure you're bringing humor into your meetings I think is really, really important because that's, that sends a message too that can infiltrate the entire culture, right? That can, that can spread out to the entire culture like a wave. If you start lightening up at your meetings and, and bring a little more fun into your meetings. And there's so many ways to do that. There are tons <laughs> of ways to do that. Opening up your meeting with a fun icebreaker where you, you pass an imaginary ball of energy around the way I get people to do sometimes in my audience or you have people stand up and everybody at the same time, so nobody feels put on the spot, everybody spells their name using only the movement of their hips. Just something totally silly to get people laughing. Are you kidding? <laughs> I am not kidding. It's a great, it's a great exercise. Even a Scientific America study, Roxanne, found that the most effective meetings are those meetings that have a lot of humor and joking around in them and bantering them because people are more honest. People open up more and they're more creative and more innovative. Um, putting in a little humor break in the middle of your meeting, having, having just a fun question where you go around the room, just something simple. You know, we used to have the rumor mill section in meetings that I managed many years ago where you had to, everybody had to do it the same way. You had to look up and down the table, lean in and then whisper word on the street is, and then share your rumor. And it made it kind of goofy and playful, which allowed people to share some uncomfortable things they had been hearing that otherwise they might not have wanted to share. So we did we did all sorts of fun things in our meetings. What, did, what, did, what a nice thing, right? Because yeah. the rumor mill is oftentimes something that can go toxic and can end up being really, really uh, detrimental to uh, a team or a culture. But the fact that you can make fun of it, oh yeah, I heard so-and-so is doing this and you kind of get it out there it, you know, in the open and where people can then laugh about it and go, oh my goodness, you heard this or that. I love that. I, I've never heard about that. The hip one is the, the, the best so far though. I have to admit, I have to try to see where I could use that, but that's how funny could that be, right? Yeah, um, right, and, and, and when you get people laughing in those serious situations, it, it just makes a world of difference in terms of how the conversation unfolds. And you can do it in virtual meetings, you can do it in person meetings, it doesn't matter. But again, back to my central point here, meetings are an incredibly important touch point. Get your meetings right, and that can have at least a starting point on on your culture. And then, and then beyond that, of course, it's everything is, is communication, right? It's all about communication, communication, communication. So as a senior leader, talking about this stuff, first of all, when you're presenting to your team, to your organization, 
lightening up, using a lot of humor, laughing at yourself helps a lot. It helps you again, be more likable. So they're more apt to listen to your message and buy your message. We know from the research, but also just using every communication opportunity point to send messages about your culture. I mean, really, we're talking about values here, right? And, right, and of course, of course. Making sure that everyone understands what your cultural norms are, that your values actually mean something, right? That, that you're, you're not just getting your team together once a year and holding hands and singing, we are the world, because your values make you feel so good. As I always say, right? Who's going to disagree with your wonderful list of values? Every company has a wonderful list of values. In fact, some of your competitors probably have the exact same list as you do. So mm -hmm. why are some organizations rocking it, some teams rocking it, and some not? It's because of those cliche sayings, actions speak louder than words and talk is cheap. So as a senior leader, you need to really, really clearly define what your values actually really mean in terms of everyone's behavior and attitude. Turn them into stories, turn them into examples, celebrate your employees that are superheroes when it comes to living your values out loud. This was such a great interview that we decided to turn it into a two-part series. Be sure to tune in next week for part two so you don't miss out on the amazing content. Thank you for tuning in again. Before I sign off, I want you to consider what is it disrupting your bottom line? Just a reminder that my book, Return on Relationships, will be available on June 10th on Amazon, and it's available today on my website at roxanderhodge.com forward slash book. For more tools, insights, and anecdotes about your leadership story, consider pre-ordering. You'll find the link in the show notes. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.